Johannes Leonos, thank you very much for agreeing to, to join this conversation series within the Digital Markets Research Hub. It's always a pleasure to, to, to learn from you. Thank you very I, much, Willis. It's a pleasure, and I learn also a lot from you. And thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. So I wanted to start. I have several questions related to institutional design, some normative aspects, more specifically digital issues, of course, because we are Digital Markets Research Hub. But I wanted to start our conversation with asking you to remind or reposition maybe your theory, so well known and so, so impactful theory of, of polycentric competition law. Uh, to this, to this 2023, we live in kind of different. Well, you, you you have published it in 2018, which is a recent a recent piece, but a lot has changed. So maybe we can start this conversation with you, basically very briefly reminding the main postulates of of, of the theory and demonstrate how it works today. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, you know, it hasn't been very long. Uh, it's almost five years now. Uh, although the piece uh, has been a little bit, um, you know, I've been thinking about that for, for a few years. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, the, the Polisen competition law uh, argument has uh, a, a descriptive and a normative angle. I mean, the, the first one, the descriptive one, was basically to say, wait a moment, you know, uh, let's look to what we really do uh, in competition law. Let's look to also the fringe discussions we have in specific areas. Uh, like media, you know, like innovation, like uh, the issue of environmental agreements. And, and let's try to understand, you know, is this what we're doing uh, in, you know, in phase with the you know, classical price theory, the so-called monocentric competition model, or are we doing something uh, different? Uh, and, and basically, you know, the, the argument was that we are doing something different. So it was looking to uh, real competition law, let's put it that way, competition law in uh, context, and understand basically how this is done in specific areas. And of course, you know, my work in the food industry, uh, like the food value chain work, as well as in digital, obviously after, helped me conceptualize better this, you know, uh, turn to polycentricity uh, as a descriptive argument in a certain way that this is what we're actually doing. So a number of public interest values are taken into account uh, and we don't necessarily, uh, you know, analyze that. Uh, we don't necessarily, uh, even acknowledge this, and that was somehow uh, one of the uh, motives of uh, of this polystyrene competition model, somehow to explain better reality, uh, the reality of competition enforcement. I mean, I wasn't really the only one. I mean, in this uh, whole discussion, you have a number of other people, uh, Chris Townley, or Brooks, etc., that have done work also on, you know, how public interest values um, uh, can be integrated into law. I mean, one of my former students, Azar Raslan, has worked on the issue um, in particular of uh, uh, merger control in South Africa. So, I mean, all these basically discussions were there. Um, and so that, that was the descriptive element. And then there was a normative element, uh, was, which is basically, you know, where we, we like to head to. I mean, what type of analysis do we want to have? Um, and, um, and there, I was always very much intrigued by uh, the discussions um, mostly between economists or so those that were very much, um, you know, taking the um, economic analysis of low model, uh, focusing on economic efficiency, that um, I think, you know, um, from a normative perspective, we're not presenting a, um, you know, a promising uh, a perspective from the point of view of uh, normative theory, because they were somehow not integrating issues of equality, and fairness, uh, but also more broadly, policy values uh, that are of importance for the social contract. And I was always intrigued of why don't we have a social contract perspective? Why don't we really look to what um, you know is the jurisdiction and its policy um, is putting forward as objectives and goals, rather than basically taking uh, a normative economics perspective and you know focusing on economic efficiency only. And this is a type of, you know, uh, issue that uh, had always somehow um, occupied my uh, my interest because even my PhD thesis back many twenty years ago on vertical restraints and on the um, you know, the more economic approach that was basically now you know, at the time was really 
you know, the um, economic imperialism was extremely important. I mean, I was really, you know, asking issues about the questions about, um, you know, issues of fairness and, and other considerations that, you know, how this could fit into the competition model and the, the legal model in a way. And that was also motivating my previous work on economic transplants, for instance, uh, as well. Um, as well as work on uh, the role of institutions uh, and why, you know, um, finding out, uh, you know, what are the institutions that are in charge of enforcing competition law might be more, and what are their capabilities might be a more interesting question than that of goals of competition law, just to show that uh, basically, you know, this is a much more complex issue than uh, what uh, the economic analysis of law scholars were basically putting forward. So, so this accumulation of that, you know, came to the this polycentric, polycentric model of competition, which is basically the idea that we need to um, to look thoroughly to uh, the social contract um, of the of a specific jurisdiction. I mean, the idea that preferences are not only expressed in, in the market, but can also be expressed by individuals in other overlapping games to which they participate. I mean, the political process is one of them. And therefore, we should take a more holistic perspective. And to a certain extent, we might possibly also uh, limit our reliance on revealed preferences. We might even, you know, take different types of perspectives there. Um, you know, one could be, it's not that you cannot have an economic perspective. You can actually have a little bit what can be more calls uh, the hypothetical revealed preferences approach uh with the social contract you can actually have a more constitutional law perspective you know i mean it's it's it, it, there's pluralism in the way actually we can address it but the idea is that um focusing just on reveal preferences uh and uh, is not necessarily enough and obviously just focusing on consumer welfare in the way it is defined in competition law this kind of narrow perspective of consumer welfare um which is somehow linked to the representative agent model that uh, no classical price has, you know, uh, not necessarily looking to the real interest of the individuals that are considered as consumers, who are not just consumers, there are also a number of other things. Um, so this, I think, uh, this, you know, my thinking was that this type of analysis was very uh, reductionist. And it made sense to a certain extent because of the methodologies, the tools that we had uh, back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, okay, uh, where this was born, but you know, with the development of technology, with the development of, you know, uh, social sciences, uh, other social science and economics, um, you know, there could be actually different sources of wisdom for us to to develop a more, uh, you know, complex model that will fit the complex economy and the complex society that we're living in. Um, and and this is also, you know, where, you know, because at the same time, 2017, 18, I was developing a little bit of this work on uh, the complex economy. I mean, very much being inspired by uh, complexity theory, complexity science. Uh, and uh, so I wrote a piece, I think it was 2019, uh, about competition for a complex economy. And at the same time, a year later, I, I wrote a piece on uh, competition law as the form of social regulation to make basically the claim that, you know, and focusing a little bit on complex equality as an element that we need to take into account. So, uh, and this work on complexity uh, somehow also led me to uh, develop different concepts um, that we can actually use in this form of new competition law, let's say. Uh, the first one was the concept of ecosystems with my joint work with Michael Yakovides because it was a concept that somehow showed this departure from the um, monocentric perspective of markets, you know, that we had, and then and the relevance of just price and this, this you know, uh, conceptualization of competitive interactions uh, in a much more complex environment. Uh, secondly, you know, my work uh, with Bruno Carballa on um, uh, on, on power, I mean, on economic power and the way actually you can use um, social science research other than economics, uh, for instance, social network theory, etc., to to develop uh, uh, different conceptions of power, which I think is extremely important because uh, if we need to, um, you know, we reconceptualize competition, we need to theorize and develop operational concepts for uh, for power because this is basically the triggering factor for competition law intervention. And of course, 
if you're interested in other dimensions of just price, you're interested in democracy, you're interested in sustainability, resilience, etc., you need to develop different concepts of power than you know the classical market power concept. So that motivated this work, this uh, this part of the work. And of course, you know, another part that hasn't uh, been completed yet because I've been basically doing other things the last uh, three and a half uh, years as the head of a competition authority, don't have really much the time to do research, was to uh, conceptualize basically the way um, competition works. I mean, how basically, what are the different models of competition that we can develop if we take this polycentric perspective and um, uh, uh, one of uh, my new pieces of work, which I hope will be completed this summer, if I have the time, is a more sociological perspective on competition. So basically looking to uh, the economic sociology uh, and try to uh, theorize different forms of competition, as well as other disciplines like population ecology, in particular. In this one, I have one of my new PhD students, uh, who is a complexity science expert, who is basically looking to population ecology, and I think it will be an extremely interesting project um, uh, in the future for him. Uh, I mean, he'll make a very interesting contribution. Um, and of course, the other uh, element of my recent work is agent-based modeling and the way this can be used in competition law um, enforcement, but also more generally, you know, uh, competition law. And this is, I think, an interesting area of research. And I've been collaborating with uh, a couple of people working on uh, you know, complexity science and computational um, uh, approaches to somehow uh, think a little bit how this agent-based modeling approach could fit in competitional enforcement. So this is a little bit, a little bit more than just the um, the polycentric competition law question that you asked, but mm -hmm. somehow it forms part of the whole. And in that context, I would say that. Um, uh, maybe you know the linkage to broader political economy questions uh, could be of importance and of value for competitional scholars. So my latest piece, uh, which uh, was just published a few weeks ago at uh, uh, the EU Law Open, which is a new open source uh, EU law journal, is basically looking to um, value capture in uh, digital capitalism, and in particular. What I, you know, um, is the move towards a political economy, uh, consensus in competition law, very much basically uh, trying to link a little bit all these discussions with the uh, current situation discussions in the US as well about the political economy model. Um, and I'm very much in favor of this uh, linkage between uh, competition and the political economy. And actually, we have been thinking with a number of uh, people to launch uh, a loan political economy in competition law, basically, uh, network uh, in the next few few months to to develop a little bit more of this angle, uh, which is a little bit you know a follow up of this polycentric competition law work that I've done in the past. So that's a little bit the whole research program. I mean, in in in, in few words, in the last the last uh, ten years, more or less. And obvious, obviously, with, with such a, a rich uh, a spectrum of of theories approaches. Um, to competition, about competition, uh, a, a, an immediate question uh, emerges about uh, how to operationalize this uh, host of, of ideas to practice. You have this invaluable experience of chairing um, uh, an important competition agency, and you obviously hear from your peers in different, in different uh, meetings that uh, we have abandoned a very convenient uh, box where everything is mono uh, monosemic essentially everything is uh, commensurable into price and it's, it 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 offers convenient logistical calculus to 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 do cost benefit analysis and to 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 adjudicate or decide what is right and what is wrong for 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 our mission as competition agency now obviously with different different uh, languages available simultaneously um we there is a risk of moving from the from the approach where nothing but price matters to the approach everything in a sense butterfly effect matters and <laughs> this would obviously be completely unenforceable you managed to sit on both chairs being very uh, 
provoc or visionistic in terms in, in your academic incarnation capacity, while simultaneously steering very efficiently and very pragmatically a uh, competition agency, the Hellenic Competition Authority. Tell us the recipe. I mean, it's a great uh, question, uh, Oles, and uh, obviously, um, you know, this is one of the uh, possible limits uh, of the uh, polycentric political economy perspective. I mean, at least perceived limit in the sense that that's great, you know, we can agree on all that, but, you know, how do you enforce this? How do you ensure legal certainty? And I think this is definitely a very important issue. Now, I have to say that um, there is actually, and I think I've seen this in the last few years, uh, this move, uh, this shift of paradigm happening, at least at the level of the heads of competition authorities, uh, also in the context of uh, international organizations that are working in the area of competition. I mean, when, you know, these new questions are um, hotly debated, um, you know, uh, for instance, you know, let me give you an example. I mean, the uh, how things uh, change. I mean, you know, when the uh, when inflation uh, somehow increased considerably uh, last year, uh, also in due because of the of the war in Ukraine, um, and of course, you know, uh, this became an important issue of public policy. Uh, many competition authorities have been thinking about, okay, is this something really related to us, you know, to our work? Uh, can we actually use competition law to struggle against inflation? And the over, you know, overwhelming basically response was that this has nothing to do with competition law. It's a macroeconomic issue. Uh, the central banks deal with that. You know, competition authorities are not necessarily there to to do something about that. I mean. However, you know, this change, I mean, this discussion the last few months about gridflation, you know, um, uh, this uh, focus on the fact that even, you know, if inflation uh, will probably go down uh, the mid uh, the midterm, you know, and uh, uh, somehow, you know, central banks might be able to, and then the, the principal institutions to deal with the problem, you know, still, you know, the fact that it will go down in a couple of years or in a year, you know, this is something that might also be creating some distributive complications and that might somehow lead some profits to profit from it, uh, some common story to profit from this uh, situation and uh, uh, in particular use of the competitive conduct um, in order to achieve uh, uh, this result. So, uh, so even there, you know, the discussions have moved to understand that competition authorities might play some role, of course, not the principal one, because this is for central banks, but still it's not something that should be completely outside their radar. So uh, the other example is sustainability, which a few years ago, you know, was completely not really a fringe topic. I mean, I remember we organized with Damien Gerard, um, uh, who was at then then at the Global Competition Law Center at College of Europe, now he's the director general of the Belgian Competition Authority, who organized a conference about sustainability and competition law with Simon Holtz as well, a number of people in 2018, I think, in Brussels. And um, a commissioner for Stagger came. And you know, we started having discussions about sustainability, but the overall idea was, you know, this is really a fringe topic. I mean, usually we cannot integrate sustainability concerns, it's public interest, it's different. You know what an impressive change happened the last few years that now you know became one of the most important aspects of competition law enforcement discussion in Europe. I mean, how to integrate sustainability concerns. Same thing with regards to social sustainability. You know, we have been discussing about collective bargaining of uh, gig workers uh, like five six years ago. I was part of a group that was trying to. Uh, help a number of uh, European trade unions to um, make the uh, argument to the competition policy cycles, circles. And this is, you know, this was somehow not really an important issue. And now, you know, we see it became mainstream. So things that we consider as not being related, you know, in the few years um, with the core of competition enforcement, a few years became important. Now, how do you manage this? Um, I think this is why, you know, I always put forward the idea that uh, institutions are the, the most important thing. I mean, you need to focus on institutional capabilities, what type of institutions you have for enforcement, and this will probably predetermine also the type of goals you can take into account. So if you remember in a piece, uh, because I know you remember because you've already referred to the piece if you, uh, in a few of your, uh, your articles, in 2013 on the goals of condition, well, that was basically the idea. Compare the institutional analysis, they need to basically understand uh, what are the institutions we have before basically looking to the, the goals. So uh, in Europe, I would say this is why we have more 
um, interesting and more uh, open discussions about sustainability and these other concerns because we have you know the competition authority like integrated independent agencies that uh, might add quite easily different forms of expertise so uh, you know the way we recruited economists back in the early 1990s we can recruit data scientists and we do recruit data scientists now we will recruit um, a sustainability economists in a few years time or some of us are trying to do that already so it's quite easy to integrate expertise in this type of independent initiative agency uh, it's more difficult to do that when you are have a court based system like the us that's also why you know the discussions about sustainability are not that important in, in the U.S. antitrust context. I mean, more I would say they're not taking like a, a principal role there as the, as the way the way they do in Europe. So institutions therefore matter. Now, uh, legal certainty is of course an important issue, um, and I think uh, no one really wants to put uh, everything under the sun into this polycentric approach. I mean, this is a mistake. Uh, I've never said that actually. By the way, if you look to the article, it's pretty clear. It says, you know, well, in Europe we have the integration clauses, we have the charter, the the uh, the constitutional uh, the constitution of the EU itself. I mean, the the treaties ask us to integrate these other specific values uh, and policies into the all other policies of the union, including competition law. So, it's a clear direction by. The constitutional, uh, the treaty drafters to do that. So, uh, from that perspective, you know, we need to respect this and we need to follow this up. Now, in other jurisdictions, you know, this might not be the case, right? So, um, but to the extent that we have this in our own jurisdiction, I think, you know, there's no reason why we should ignore uh, this direction that is provided by, uh, by the treaty. And, um, and this is a little bit, uh, you know, this. What I've been discussing, you know, many years ago is this idea that, you know, law should be uh, is normatively closed in the sense that, you know, we have very specific, you know, values and norms that are, you know, included in the law and we need to interpret it. You know, of course, you know, we have, you know, some discretion to interpret it, but, you know, we cannot go contra legem there. Uh, okay, there's uh, always some kind of... Um, you know, limited discretion to, to that extent, but it's cognitively open in the sense that the law can um, be fair, use different uh, sort of uh, disciplinary knowledge and social science knowledge in order to achieve its aims. It doesn't have to be only uh, IO economics. It can be different types of economics. It can be also other uh, social sciences. That's why actually I've been in favor uh, lately, and I think I mentioned this in the European Competition Day in uh, in Stockholm like a few uh, few weeks ago uh, that we probably will need to uh, to recruit not just the chief economist but the chief social scientist I mean maybe uh, the EU level because you know uh, uh, we need to um, to open up a little bit to other disciplines than just economics and in particular IO economics. I, I really I think I, I recollect this 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 paper where you said this Lumanian uh, uh, idea. Uh, I think it was judging the economist, or maybe maybe you said it elsewhere. But that that was really impactful paper. Um, I think and very iconoclastic uh, at that time of 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 prevalence or dictate of kind of uh, monocentric, let's say, perception of competition. You let us. Move but to you, the you, you also in your own work, I think, Oles, you have done uh, quite a lot in terms of this normative argument this kind of more pluralist basically perspective uh, as well so uh, and i think we have been a, it, it has been a few of us that have been thinking along the same lines the last few years um and uh, and i think what is really interesting is that what could be considered as a fringe type of issue um becomes now extremely important for instance i mean inequality i mean is is an issue that i remember actually organizing a conference back in 2015 at ucl on uh, competition and inequality and most of the speakers that I invited, I will not disclose it, but people can look actually, uh, I mean, on, on the website uh, of the center, I mean, who are the speakers, excellent colleagues. I mean, with the exception of one um, uh, who actually was um, at the time the head of the South African Competition Authority, uh, all of them actually were very critical about, you know, the role of competition law in, uh, uh, you know, and how inequality can be, so have become an issue for, for competition law. 
Well, look at the discussions now. I mean, um, uh, we, you know, after we published the book with um, collected volume with uh, Damien Gerard, um, and then there have been other works that have been published in the field. There have been a number of uh, empirical studies on the on, on this issue. I mean, uh, it became like a mainstream issue. Huh? So, uh, which shows, I mean, to to all you know, young scholars that you know, if you have an idea and it looks a little bit crazy. Uh, don't really, uh, you know, don't get impressed by what you hear, you know, uh, you know, work on this and, and move it forward. Janis, let me, let me pause on this, uh, on this fantastic volume collected for, uh, which you, which you done jointly with, with Damian Gerard, I think dedicated to Eleanor Fox, uh, uh, exactly, yeah. one of the co-authors, it, it's not at the top of my head, mentioned very prudently at that time, one of the contributors rather, that while we become more open and we start learning from others as well, and they are well trained to do uh, competition policy differently, um, we have we, we, we shouldn't be so self-confident anymore. We have to learn from others, but we cannot get these skills automatically. So now yeah. I wanted to link it with the question on the digital uh, digital policy of this kind of pro ex, uh, pro competition ex ante wave which we experience in these days in Europe, in UK, and other jurisdictions. Um, obviously, the agenda is quite ambitious, at least in political cycles. There were there were discussions about the attempts to somehow to to speed up a little bit uh, our tech sector, at least consumer part of tech sector. How do you see it uh, developing these days? Do we are we on the right track, not institutionally and in terms of the law itself? But uh, how, can can you provide us your understanding of what are the big, uh, you know, the the decision makers, the pol the political elites are considering as being the the meta goal of let's say DMA. I mean, I, I will not, you know, put myself into the political elites because, um, you know, I've been, I've, I've very, uh, um, I haven't participated, uh, uh, you know, very actively in the drafting of the text. I mean, I was uh, part of the negotiating team from Greece, you know, the DMA. So I followed a little bit the way the DMA uh, developed, um, and now I'm also a member of the the high level group for the DMA. Uh, so um, I would say the DMA. Um, is a, a text that aims somehow to deal with uh, the problem that ecosystems, uh, you know, um, set to competition law enforcement. In the, in the way, you know, we had this focus on relevant markets and not ecosystems. We actually uh, had uh, for some time overlooked uh, the importance of uh, what I call uh, is vertical competition. Um, we basically, because of this focus on um, economic efficiency, we ignored uh, uh, the fairness aspects uh, that are important in this context. So, and I think that DMA is a way to uh, deal with these issues. Um, so obviously uh, it's too early to say much about the way this will evolve. And, uh, but I think uh, the whole idea would be for this to, um, and I think it's good that the European Commission has the um, the competence, I mean, in, uh, in in implementing the DMA, of course, with some help from national competition authorities or national authorities that have been appointed by the member states to to help the Commission. Um, so, because we need to to have a, a broader European perspective on on how this specific new exante regulation will um, will be implemented, but. I think the DMA um, will possibly be completed with other tools in the future. I mean, there's a lot of discussion now with uh, the reform of regulation on 2003 on, uh, you know, bringing back again this uh, new competition tool, not just for digital markets, but for other markets as well. Uh, of course, you have all the other um, uh, important uh, uh, acts like the Data Act that doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't only deal with, I mean, like, well, the DMA deals with gatekeepers, the Data Act is actually much broader. Uh, you have actually efforts to enhance um, commons, uh, like the Data Governance Act, or even the European uh, Health Space, um, uh, Health Data Space uh, Initiative. So, uh, 
I think it's too early to see how these all these will interact, but uh, I think the idea is to uh, say that, well, competition enforcement exposed is not sufficient, um, that we need uh, that to be complemented with other tools, ex-ante tools. We have to develop a toolkit approach. There's no position between regulation and competition. It's basically part of a uh, a complementary approach. I mean, I, uh, I would say both of them are not antagonists, but actually uh, there are synergies uh, developing, uh, you know, with um, between competition law enforcement and um, uh, these uh, ex-ante regulatory tools. Uh, and then, you know, there's some uh, space for experimentation uh, to member states because, uh, uh, and of course, we'll see how Article 3 of Regulation 2003 will be interpreted, will be maintained, changed, whatever, you know, we don't know yet. But there is still, you know, some uh, experimentation uh, space left for member states because they can develop concerning uh, unilateral conduct, stricter national competition provisions, and a number of member states have done so. I mean, the Germany be, being a, a good example, other member states as well. Uh, and some other member states tried to develop uh, Greece, for instance, we had this ecosystem provision, which at the end actually did not work out. Uh, but, you know, you know, things can change. So I think, you know, this is what I can say for the time being. Uh, it's too early to conclude of what will be the implication of the of these ex-ante uh, regulatory tools. But it will be very complicated, I think, for a, uh, I mean, thinking like um, more of, as an academic, I mean, teaching all that to students might be, could be like an important challenge. Uh, I mean, in particular, thinking about the very limited amount of time we have at our disposal in competition law classes or, or generally in master classes or undergraduate classes, I mean, it's going to be a lot of things to cover. Uh, and it's interesting to think about the way, you know, we can communicate that uh, in a sim simple but still relevant way to students. People were keen to read DMA and DSA. Now people somehow already forget that DSA exists. It's so, we are so busy with our narrow... Oh, yes. Uh, the class I mean, and I think... It's narrower and narrower. And I think, you know, you have, I mean, I, I, I you know, you have to read the DSA, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, the AI Act, I mean... It's uh, it's 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 a, quite a lot of work. Now we have the UK one, so uh, pretty long as well. So um, yeah, it's not easy to be in this area. I mean, uh, and I think for us, an academic and try to put that everything together and communicate that to students would be quite an important challenge. An endeavor. Coming back to the DMA, if I may. Fairness contestability uh, story. We obviously hear the the cluster of fair, fairness oriented uh, people who would say that the, the main KPI of the DMA would be uh, bringing some order to the vertical dimension of competition, forcing gatekeepers to be more uh, respectful, more mindful, kind of doing platform to business regulation plus or 2.0 version. Mm -hmm. That would be a, a, a good criterion for saying, okay, DMA delivers the minimum. On the other hand, we see contest. I caricaturize, of course, but imagine mm -hmm. there, there is kind of people who who would say that if we are keen to to promote competition or to open up markets or contestability, we shouldn't we should be mindful of the need to to trigger horizontal competition, competition mm -hmm. at core platform services. And then the main question which I wanted to address to you in 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 the perspective of your ecosystem discussions. What type of horizontal competition would be desirable? Would competition between seven super heavyweight players in the closed, closed league generating all the traditional metrics of successful competition or su successful competition uh, competitive outcome would be the acceptable format of what DMA could let, 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 let me answer by asking a question. Um, would you like, would you think that um, a world in which you have only, let's say, three firms that are present in all possible markets, right? There are three, they compete intensively, but they are all basically possible markets. I mean, they have there are three ecosystems that actually, you know, are somehow integrating huge amount of possible markets and, and functionalities. Will we have actually, will we say that this is a, uh, we'll be happy that this is really competitive uh, world. I mean, 
It's a question. I mean, I'm not, from my perspective, I don't think so. In, in the sense that, uh, yes, it is extremely important to have inter-ecosystem competition, and there is inter-ecosystem competition, but it's not sufficient. Uh, you need also to have inter-ecosystem competition in the sense that you have independent firms that are able to participate to these uh, ecosystems that uh, provide value with the, with the fact that you have, you know, because of the rules that are, you know, uh, regulating this ecosystem, this provides extra value to those that are basically acting in the ecosystem and those that buy basically the products from the ecosystem rather than buy them from one different source. And, um, and therefore, you know, I think it's important to keep also this other dimension of intra-ecosystem competition, either horizontal intra-ecosystem competition, for instance, when you have the ecosystem orchestrator being both a platform and a merchant, and therefore competing as a merchant with other uh, independent uh, companies, uh, as well as a vertical aspect of vertical competition, intra-ecosystemic vertical competition, which is also about, which is basically about who gets uh, part of the surplus value created by innovation and by the ecosystem. And they would not like to have, you know, um, someone that will completely exploit basically uh, the various uh, complementors and will reduce their incentives to innovate. They will reduce their, uh, in, uh, their entrepreneurial freedom uh, in a way to develop uh, and the variety that they can offer um, and the complexity actually that they can offer because, you know, uh, I will think of this as a form of ecology. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's nice and it's important and it's efficient, if I can use the term, to have variety in the ecosystem, okay, in the ecology. No? So uh, um, this can be extremely important from a resilience perspective, for instance, you know, or from a sustainability perspective. You know, one of the things we discovered with COVID-19 was that the just-in-time um, uh, distribution systems that were extremely efficient on which UK supermarkets were uh, somehow uh, were organized, this actually failed. And this led to uh, difficulties. And these, you know, led obviously to intervention by uh, the public uh, authorities uh, because, you know, they were delivering extremely, you know, well in uh, price, at the price level, you know, and uh, uh, and of course they were efficient from that perspective, but they were actually not efficient from the perspective of resilience and security of supply, which shows that, um, you know, it's important to have this multidimensional perspective, in particular in a world like the one we're living in which, uh, you know, high impact, low probability events might happen uh, and might, you know, we have witnessed already a few of them like the last few years. And I think, you no, know, this is something that we need to, to have in mind. And, and this is something that public authorities have in mind. I mean, if you, if you think about the way the various markets are organized, um, and also the, you know, the, we see a little bit of a rebirth of the European industrial policy developing some areas. Think about, I was reading, uh, most recently, uh, um, a student say about um, the um, uh, uh, the batteries for electric cars. You know, I mean, there, there you know, you have you know uh, interesting dimensions that you know innovation, of competition, of sustainability, of resilience, of uh, geopolitical somehow concerns about you know security of supply. Uh, similarly, you know, if you think about agriculture, I mean, this is an area where we have the development of a special competition law. Uh, and in particular, you know, we also saw that in the context of sustainability, we uh, were happy there, at least as EU, to take a much more liberal perspective on sustainability than the one we took in the draft horizontal, now that the horizontal uh, guidelines. Because we, uh, Article 210A, of the CMO regulation accepts basically sustainability concerns, even if uh, with the only, with as an only condition, uh, indispensability. I mean, the other conditions of Article 101, Paragraph 3, I mean, uh, are not there. So it's it's more open to sustainability concerns than in the context of Article 101, Paragraph 3. So, I mean, that shows that we are, you know, from sector to sector, we take, you know, this. Um, broader polycentric perspective, and you know we adjust 
value of competition with other the other values that we want to put forward. I mean, the media is another example. I mean, uh, about concentration in the media sector. I mean, we are uh, having a different perspective on the way you know we can implement competition law, and sometimes you know what is effective competition has to be determined according to the overall context that is provided by the uh, social contract in question and the importance of the, va the, va the, the value of pluralism, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, competition. So uh, in a way, you know, pluralism is actually a value that could be used to interpret what is effective competition in that context, okay? And this is provided by the constitutional text. It's a, it's, it's a direction that is provided by the legislator. So these are, I think, important elements to take into account. Indeed, this this sounds very convincing, Yanis. Um, so do you think there are some uh, uh, on cons uh, some undertakings? Let's leave leaving aside uh, ge geographic questions of geography. Who would be direct beneficiaries uh, of of constraining gatekeepers by the DMA, and who would be able to introduce their core platform services or scale up their core platform services? In the European Union, as, a, as a, obviously, when, I, when I cannot, for obvious reason, I cannot disclose any. Uh, even if I think that there are some undertakings that could probably benefit out of it, I cannot obviously mention their names. Uh, but I, I, I do think that you know, um, a number of uh, undertakings could possibly uh, be able because of these of these rules to uh, develop further. I mean to. Um, Possibly upgrade, if I can use that term, uh, in uh, in the value chain. I mean, in the digital value chain, and um, and to develop possibly uh, more surplus value uh, for for all stakeholders, not not just for consumers, but also for uh, for the workers and uh, uh, and for for local communities. Uh, uh, so um, yeah, I mean, but that's I mean, I don't, you know, this is something that obviously we have to see. I mean, uh, you know, I think it's important. In a few years' time, to obviously uh, try to uh, see the possible implementation effect of of the DMA and all this uh, this regulation, uh, in order to obviously see we have done the right choice. I mean, this is extremely important. I mean, we have to base our decisions on evidence. Absolutely, and obviously, it's however proactive modality we adhere to within competition uh, law and policy clusters. It would be ultra virus even for the most proactive. Uh, adherent of, of most proactive competition policy to to look in in such uh, kind of uh, micromanager micromanagerial dimension. Of course, I fully agree with you. But obviously, the commission is a is, decides and college and these issues probably somehow I invisibly. Think, I present. think it's yeah. I think it's we you know we don't necessarily have a specific outcome in mind. I mean, you know, it's not that we are uh, doing this because there's a specific outcome in terms of how many European, um, you know, big tech companies would like to develop in the future, or I don't know, what could be the benefits for consumers uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, euros, uh, you know, cons direct consumer benefits, you know, indirect consumer basic quality, innovation, etc. I mean, I think it's more about um, acting you know, developing a process, you know, uh, and, um, and and see, you know, if that process will bring better results, uh, will be more performant. Uh, but having performance there being judged across different dimensions, right? Uh, so much more complex idea of performance than what we usually had in the past. Um, because, of course, that's also why we have in the EU all these debates about uh, you know, also the link to democracy, also to, you know, so things that are not necessarily part of competition law enforcement, okay? So, I mean, there's uh, some of our colleagues that are working on the link between democracy and competition, or Elias Deutscher being an example, um, uh, many others as well. Um, but I think, you know, this is an area where, you know, it, it, it provides a different perspective of what is performance in that sense, you know? Uh, and I think this is this more this more complex um idea of performance uh we need to to have in mind um i mean this is something i've been discussing a little bit in the in this paper on sociological concepts of competition because there has been also a lot of work in uh, in sociology uh particular uh Luke Boltanski at Evano about uh performance um about different 
uh, you know, uh, spheres uh, uh, of uh, of policy and in how you know different elements of performance might be combined. So that's that's an interesting element to, to have in mind. Let us let us stay, stay with this. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we can call it sociological or rather institutional dimension. And um, obviously, however proactive you are, you cannot go that far to uh, cherry pick uh, the winners. And however conservative you are, you cannot acknowledge the obvious that the enforcement man, enforcers mentality, case workers mentality will be changed or is gradually changing, and they have to be equipped with a with the, some new skills probably. Mm -hmm. um, maybe pejoratively, some authors call them in the past box stickers. Now they are much more involved and more um, pro uh, proactive. Or more, they, they expect to combine different factors, if not goals, at least external factors into, into their considerations. Do you think uh, this change in their mental or their professional uh, attitude or their professional DNA uh, is inevitable? Do you observe it already? And maybe you can identify some yeah. elements of this change? I think, um, as I mentioned before, I mean, uh, the things have changed at the level of, at least, you know, this is my uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, my opinion. I mean, at the level of the of the heads of competition authorities, there's more agreement that these are important issues to take into account. I mean, it's not that everyone agrees, but I mean, there is definitely, it's not a fringe issue anymore. Um, I would say that... Um, it will take more time for uh, this uh, polycentric vision, of, if I can call it that way, makes its way to uh, the staff of competition authorities. Um, at least, you know, the current staff, in the sense that um, the, in the same way, you know, as we had to wait a long time for lawyers to be able to learn to work with economists that we have been recruiting in the 1990s, you know, and, and bringing into the economic approach, the same actually with all these other disciplines. Uh, so it will take some time. So we will need some to develop new programs, new training programs uh, for competition authorities. Um, and this is actually extremely important to do in the next few years uh, that will uh, somehow provide uh, the uh, disciplinary basis for this uh, interdisciplinary interaction and collaboration that needs to develop and this mutual understanding. Um, so, and this is definitely something that um, uh, both competition authorities, but also academic institutions should promote uh, and, and extremely important to do in the future. So um, yes, I think, you know, there could be a possibility for new training programs, for eventually new uh, postgraduate programs, uh, to develop that will integrate all these um, dimensions. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm actually thinking about a number of things myself uh, in, in this space uh, to watch in the future. Yeah. Let us, let us move, Yannis, to another relationship between competition and privacy. We didn't mention it, surprisingly, because it, it, it's... It... Um, impactful paper you have published uh, recently, and I wanted to ask your observation. The one with Nick Economides you mentioned. Sorry. The one with Nick Economides. Now this work with Nick Economides. Yeah, yeah in yeah. the Journal of Competition Law and Economics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wanted to ask your reflection on this uh, quite visible trend, uh, where uh, let's say before, roughly speaking. Uh, I don't know, Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Analytica, the, 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 the critical mass of society were not so mindful of the importance of privacy and data, or their personal mm -hmm. data, how, how they can be somehow processed and uh, and, and uh, added value can be generated. Now there is a critical mass. P people do care and they are, my, are more mindful of this. Yet what we observe clearly is that the, the, the mightiest digital ecosystems are equally transforming themselves. This metamorphosis is quite present. And they say, look, we were being kind of cowboy style capitalists in the past. Now we are, we are ready to be the guardians of your data. And it's better to have it in one stop shop rather than spreading it to the kind of race to the bottom. So to say, as we have it in programmatic advertisement uh, model, 
And it looks convincing to many, at least for privacy, privacy activists, that we can compromise competition, we can sacrifice competition essentially, but have at least one stop shop with one compliance team who would try to calibrate their, their business models in a way which would somehow protect competition. We also hear it in this explanatory or stakeholder workshops in the DMA, this privacy counter argument is being always raised. How do you reflect upon this emerging trend? I don't find this argument very convincing, I have to say. I mean, in the sense that, you know, um, you, you mentioned before that uh, we had some form of um, wild, wild west uh, during a period of time where, you know, people were basically harvesting data, um, using it, and, and obviously um, exploiting it um, and getting surplus value out of it without basically the people from whom the data, uh, you know, was harvested to um, have an equal uh, or a fair amount of, of this value. Um, and and you know the reason we had that situation was what I what I call in the, in this recent piece on a political economy perspective uh, the silence of the law. I mean, uh, the law was silent as to uh, you know who has property rights on the data and uh, uh, and you know there wasn't really any specific thinking about that. I mean the of course you know the the GDPR exists you know existed. I mean not you know it's it's fairly recent development in some jurisdictions that are now basically getting something like the GDPR, not even close to it, but in a way, you know, at least moving towards that direction. But, um, you know, it was a silence of the law that led to, to this exploitation. Now, now that we see the law intervening and um, somehow, you know, developing, uh, I think, powerful um, interventions uh, ex exposed as well as ex ante, um, we you know we see this type of arguments uh, developing. Now, okay, I mean, for some areas, um, like for instance, uh, you know, health data or lifestyle data that concern sensitive topics, which are you know, could be like sexual orientation, it could be you know different types of uh, very sensitive type of information. So uh, for these, you know, we have a very high uh, level of protection. I mean, under Article 9, if I remember well, of the GDPR. So, uh, but still, you know, even with that, um, we are developing at the same time at the European level, the European health data space, which is basically what is helping uh, the dissemination of these data, of course, under very strict conditions, and of course, making sure that this is protected, but to enable other players that have equal levels of protection uh, to, to develop. Uh, so, so from my perspective, uh, you know, the policy is here to combine competition and high levels of protection. And let's not forget that uh, it's because of competition that uh, we have the development of a number of uh, players that are, uh, you know, more um, aware of this privacy dimension and they are more protective of that uh, because they see that there's a market for it and, uh, and they want to develop the products and there's competition maybe on this parameter of competition as well, developing the, the you know, the privacy as a parameter of competition. So I don't necessarily think that this is a valid argument um, but of course, you know, uh, each situation needs to be assessed according to the facts that we have, you know, and, you know, I cannot really make a very general kind of uh, um, comment here just to say that, you know, uh, in my view, this is not really a very convincing uh, argument. Yes, I have also a question about the, the enforcement, the mechanics uh, of, of the enforcement if you still have time. And more specifically, I wanted to ask you a question about commitments. We mm. had kind of hot discussion in uh, during the DMA, and it looks that, well, it, it depends how you read uh, the provisions of Article 25, but it looks that it's clearly being reduced. The scope for commitment has been reduced with the kind of the, the motto or the, the message that, uh, that we don't want these compromises. We have sufficient tools uh, to 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 force the gatekeepers to comply and uh, commitment. 
but but don't you think that commitments is essentially a healthy toolkit for this participatory uh, regulatory dialogue mechanism? How do you see the role of commitments in ex post mm. competition law, and how they do, do we have to copy paste them in ex ante regulation, or maybe you have to refine them? In a sense, I mean to make, for example, the enforcer the room to offer what we what we would expect the infringer or non-compliant mm. undertaking to to deliver rather than expecting the undertaking to propose uh, i mean you know i think all this discussion on the dma and obviously you know this is uh, just an impression i haven't been you know i haven't been able to think along you know you just posed the question so i was trying to to think a little bit across whereas i mean i think that um the the legal base of the dma uh has led to certain choices uh, in particular, you know, this um, refusal to get into the very case-specific uh, type of assessment in each, you know, I mean, because this will look a little bit closer to the competition model. Um, so that's why, you know, we haven't seen any uh, reference to business models, you know, and, and you know, this flexibility that we see in the UK approach of codes of conduct, et cetera, which is not present in DMA, I think has many things to do with the, uh, the choice of legal basis and the overall uh, structure, institutional structure uh, in Europe uh, compared to the UK and other jurisdictions. So uh, from that perspective, I would say, you know, to the extent that commitments uh, are available under exposed competition law and um, uh, in case that the DMA doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, achieve its purpose, at least for a specific type of case, you know, there could always be the possibility to bring in exposed enforcement later and then use commitments uh, as a tool. Uh, but that's kind of a very quick answer to uh, not very well thought through uh, to a very interesting question. Um, now, uh, you know that um, a number of colleagues in particular, uh, Stavros Macris have developed this responsive competition law model and the we're basically focusing on the development of the these various tools, um, uh, flexible tools, commitments being one of them, as uh, settlements being another, you know, as a way forward, you know, uh, this is a kind of a responsive model. Uh, in particular, when you think about uh, sometimes the difficulties of a case, you know, the, the period that you, you know, the resources that you spend on a case, the, the risks that you have, uh, Concerning, uh, you know, the um, the review level by the courts, uh, all these, you know, might lead you to to choose uh, sometimes this model, uh, uh, this uh, uh, bargaining model in a way. I mean, it's commitments or these settlements, um, or actually soft law elements, soft law tools to to achieve your purposes. Um, but still, you know, I I think that um, it's very important to have also. Uh, uh, clear rules, prohibitions, infringements, you know, and uh, either ex ante or ex post, uh, because this is really going to provide direction uh, and will also, uh, in a way, uh, enable competition authorities to use these other bargaining uh, type of tools that they have at their disposal. So a combination of the two is is extremely important. But you know, you know what you know what I say is probably. Um, you know, just the first remark on, on this issue. Uh, I haven't really thought very thoroughly about that. And if I, if I can ask you another express question, mm -hmm. uh, which you didn't have an opportunity to reflect upon uh, in this conversation yet, um, quasi-criminal nature of exposed enforcement is well justified because probably we need, or definitely we, we need to discover information which is secret, which is very easy to dispose, to delete or hide particular in digital files, so all the down rate stuff, etc. Obviously, quasi-criminal nature of exposed enforcement goes beyond the the in, in investigatory competences of of case workers, but it's a significant part of it. We somehow copy pasted it to the exposed enforcement model as well, essentially, particular and and also with draconian fines as well. Do you think that it somehow matches well the modality of exp exposed? A or ex ante uh, competition law, competition law sensulato, where uh, the emphasis is more on dialogue rather than on penalizing for something which the gatekeepers might well not even be aware of what exactly they, they if you talk about obligations of Article 6. 
um, wouldn't be it would be more effective to decrease the expectations but impose fines smaller fines more regularly playing a kind of different different game is it something which was on the table at any point or it's too uh, too complex to, to consider even to be honest i i you know i don't remember any proposal being that we have a different sanctions model and that we are and i think it's also a matter for uh the fact that you know if you want the exanta tool to be effective um it needs to have teeth you know i mean so uh if you don't provide it then it's not going to be effective so you'll end up basically having the same problems again and you know move with the exposed enforcement which is very long it takes a long time so uh that's i think why i mean it's probably maybe a simple uh practical reason why you know uh we uh we have this strictness uh, I mean, if i can use that term in uh, the exanta fulston tool and uh and we also somehow uh you know promoted this idea of private enforcement you know just to create deterrence you know and i think this was part of the uh, at least the idea that you know for you know for this example regime to be effective it needs to be deterrent enough so we need to combine private enforcement uh, as well as, as sanctions uh and of course you know the dialogue is needed because it's also uh the way you can uh, somehow acquire knowledge in a very specific area where there's quite a lot of, a lot of asymmetry of knowledge between uh, the competition authorities or the enforcers uh here the enforcer the dma and uh, uh and the companies uh, so uh uh, so this is a type of thing that you need in order to uh, uh, ensure that you understand fully what's going on and you don't commit any uh, errors, any, uh, which could be very costly. So, and I think that's quite important in terms of dissemination, understanding, and knowledge, and uh, and expertise. Yeah. Mm. And but this obviously comes at cost uh, of due process and very high standard of of, of proof in in, in court. But I think so. I mean, I mean, you know, you cannot do otherwise uh, under the EU uh, system. I mean, we have, I think, uh, uh, you know, we have a very good system in terms of uh, ensuring the the rights of defence and uh, uh, and I think you know, but I, I you know, from my perspective, I have to say that you know, obviously, we have to be very respectful of the rights of defence. Uh, uh, but we need also to think uh, about the rights of the victims of uh, the competitive conduct. I mean, uh, that's probably something that is not necessarily taken into account sometimes because we put too much emphasis on the rights of defense and this procedure is very important again. But sometimes we forget that, uh, you know, if uh, anti-competitive conduct that, um, uh, you know, leads to important consumer harm uh, and important harm to uh, the business partners, for instance, of the firm, um, well, you know, uh, we ha we have to think also of, of the rights of the victims. Huh? So, uh, uh, ensuring that the competition authorities are, have the tools to do their job well and effective, effectively, you know, it's something that will obviously help uh, protect the rights of the victims of the competitive conduct. So, uh, and these are equally important rights as the rights of defense. Mm. Yeah, this, you obviously, and one of the privileges. And, and opportunities to 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 to, to direct a, a competition agency is to 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 engage in constant communication not only with your peers in the European Union in the ECN but also within the global uh, competition agency uh, colleagues. Did you happen to observe some instrument, some toolkit, some practice in one of of of, of many? Uh, many jurisdictions globally, which you would somehow consider, mm, it's interesting. Maybe it's something which we have to to somehow transpose or to 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 scrutinize in more detail in terms of adopting to 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 the Greek or EU competition uh, mm. vocabulary. Look, I mean, uh, obviously, I'm very quickly thinking. I mean, an example is um, you know Section Five of the FTC Act. I mean, if I can. Uh, refer to that. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a very interesting tool, uh, you know, very flexible. Um, I really like the statement, the policy statement the FTC uh, issued. I mean, and you, you see when you read this statement, you know, how uh, how useful this tool can be uh, for a competition. Uh, 
And to a certain extent, um, you know, the the case law on uh, uh, invitations to collude and uh, price selling in the context of Section Five was an inspiration for for us uh, in Greece when we uh, uh, adopted uh, the new Article One A of the Greek Competition, which creates the first time in Europe a prohibition for invitations to collude and uh, price signaling, uh, the forms of price signaling under certain conditions. Because I mean, as an unilateral conduct, of course, you know. So, uh, so that was an example, uh, in a way of, uh, and you know, similarly, they had in Australia a, a provision, it was Article Forty Four Z or something like that, of the Australian Competition Act, uh, concerning price signaling that uh, you know they had for a few years. So that you know, these were interesting um, uh, precedents for us to to think uh, when we. Uh, uh, drafted the law. I mean, that's uh, one of the examples that you know we might think others as well. C can you highlight to us briefly what what is going on in, in, in on Look, the table I mean, of I, the head of competition president? Yeah, I can I can discuss about things that are uh, in the making, and of course um, they have been uh, publicized in the past. So I cannot obviously disclose uh, uh, things that we haven't really uh, put on the public. Uh, uh, space, but um, you know, we are currently uh, completing uh, a sector inquiry on um, uh, on um, healthcare uh, and insurance markets, and I think uh, this is a quite interesting area, in particular because of the use of data and uh, development of data capabilities by different companies, the the merging of a number of uh, players. Uh, um, it's somehow merging the insurance, health insurance, and healthcare. Uh, together, so uh, uh, so these go, you know interesting elements uh, here there. So we have actually um, a uh, a market investigation reference uh, concerning fuels. Uh, so this is a, I mean that we're not the only ones in Europe. I mean there are quite a few other member states that are doing sector inquiries on fuels, uh, or in particular because of the of the inflation and you know the uh, price rises, etc. So this is quite interesting for us because um, we uh, are also look into the rockets and feathers phenomenon, you know, and trying to understand uh, when this happens and, you know, if there could be some anti-competitive cause to that or it could be explained for, from other factors. Um, so we have a number of ongoing uh, investigations that are arriving to the end, but I cannot disclose much, but it concerns very interesting areas of enforcement. Um, so, uh, so this is something that, of course, to to watch, um, to watch the space, uh, and of course, we'd love to uh, develop a little bit more the sandbox. Um, it hasn't attracted as much attention by Greek companies as we expected. Um, I think this is a new tool. Um, it somehow companies are thinking about how to use it. You know, they're thinking which cases they might be able to use it. So. Uh, we had a number of companies that contacted us to ask for more information about the tool, and we would like to do uh, a little bit more to promote the tool and uh, to see, you know, how this could be made more um, usable for companies and ensure that they have legal certainty and they're not afraid to come and talk to us about their projects. Um, so that's something that I would like to uh, to work on in the next few months. And of course, you know, we, we have interesting um, cases. I mean, not cases, I would say these are uh, two market investigations. One of them was already has already been published. The other one will be published in the next couple of weeks, I think, um, maybe a month, uh, where we are implemented for the first time, I think, in Europe, a common ownership. Uh, and, um, and we actually... Uh, um, I think this is an interesting uh, area of research, in particular common knowledge, but also more generally financialization. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, and, you know, we have been doing some work on that at uh, UCL uh, the last few years. Uh, and myself as well before with the BRICS uh, Competition Policy Center on, on, on financialization of the food sector. Um, so, so this is, I think, an area to to basically develop a little bit further. Uh, and we're probably going to organize a, um, another uh, workshop on common ownership uh, in the next uh, couple of months uh, to also discuss about these cases, but uh, with these market investigation references, but also more generally, you know, the literature about common ownership.
I think uh, your, your colleague uh, at UCL, Andrew McLean... Uh, uh, yeah, Andrew has yeah. done his thesis on, 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 uh, on financialization, um, you know, mostly. Um, so, and, 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 you know, it's an area that we are, you know, have been working on in the last few years uh, in this area. I mean, and I think, you know, we, we have a, a dimension of financialization in the, uh, one of the um, uh, policy projects that we have uh, at the center, we had at the center, but of course, you know, as a competition authority uh, had it's it's an interesting area. It's not necessarily that it's a commercial issue, not a problem. It's not always a problem. It can also sometimes be had eventually positive implications in terms of, you know, innovation. I mean, there's been some research putting that forward. Uh, so it always depends on the case. But I think it's a very interesting dimension to have in mind. Johannes, it is always a great pleasure talking to you. We, we have this tradition uh, in this series to finish by asking the guests to provide some recommendations to students. We have addressed this pedagogical aspect in passing earlier in this conversation, but maybe you can suggest some, some magic toolkit to, to not- to Magic toolkit, I mean, I wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, so I think it's an interesting, I mean, students, I think are excited by the area. I mean, I think uh, as far as I can, uh, uh, I Remember, I mean, I'm not uh, teaching now. I mean, much teaching now, but uh, it's um, it's students are extremely interested in uh, in this combination of economics, technology, law. I mean, the policy aspects, and I think you know we um, putting that forward is something that will uh, uh, earn students' attention. And uh, I mean, maybe if there's a magic tool, it's about that in an instant way to attract additional students to. To, for them to see, you know, uh, topical issues, to work on specific problems, uh, and understand better, you know, uh, how uh, this competition law doctrine is is developing, and uh, and how competition enforcers basically act. You honestly, Anos, thank you very much for joining this conversation series today. Thank you uh, very much, Oles, uh, for the, the opportunity. Uh, it's always a pleasure to discuss with you and. Uh, Keep up with the great work you are, you are doing as well, uh, you know, in terms of your research, but also disseminating uh, the research of other people and uh, and developing a little bit the discussion uh, in the competition law and uh, policy community. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Johannes.